welcome to the second in our criminal justice conversation series. This is a collaboration between the SMU Law Review and the Decent Criminal Justice Reform Center. My name is Pam Metzger. I'm the director of the Decent Criminal Justice Reform Center, and I'm the luckiest person in the world because I get to host these fabulous conversations. Uh, so today's conversation, we're focusing on racial injustices. Focusing might be the wrong word because it's sort of hard to know where to begin that conversation. Um, when we talk about the criminal legal system. But let me introduce our panelists. Um, we have joining us today Professor Bennett Capers, who teaches um, at Fordham Law School and is the director of the Center on Race, Law, and Justice there. He has been widely published in pretty much every venue I can think of. Um, he also spent 10 years as an assistant U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York, so he's kind of royalty here. And uh, we're very pleased to have him joining us. In addition, we have Samil Trivedi, who is the senior staff attorney at the ACLU's Criminal Law Reform Project. Um, his work has been really focused on all, all of the same issues that we're going to be talking about today, but in different fora. So prosecution, criminal law reform litigation, um, lawsuits dealing with everything from legislative advocacy to voter education to mass incarceration. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with him on some issues around the criminal legal system in New Orleans and the former district attorney there. So it's really a thrill for me to be able to speak with him today about these topics. So I wanted to start off um, by asking you, Bennett, if you could just kind of frame the conversation for us and, and lead us into the way we're gonna think about and talk about racial injustices in the criminal legal system. Sure, and first of all, thanks for having me. So big thanks to Pam and the Decent Center and the Law Review and SMU and you know, anybody else I'm forgetting, I'm, I'm so looking forward to this conversation. And, you know, it's interesting just even asking how to frame sort of the interplay between race and criminal justice. There's so much <laughs> interplay. I, I was on a, a panel a few weeks ago where I sort of said, you know, with respect to criminal law and criminal justice, race is often the elephant in the room. And another panelist, when he spoke, sort of responded, you know something? Race is the room. It's not just the elephant. It's, it's the it's the room. So um, I mean, there's so many uh, interconnections. I could talk about um, 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 disparities in sentencing or prison or racial profiling. Instead, you know, since all of this is going on on the in the backdrop, of, you know, the Derek Chauvin trial. Um, um, for murdering George Floyd, I'm going to bring up something or start with something that I think is almost a, a, a frequent refrain. So not necessarily in the Derek Chauvin case, but it is a refrain in other cases where you involving race, where you often hear the refrain, this has nothing to do with race. So in the trial for the officer who shot Philando Castillo, quote, the case has nothing to do with race. In the trial of a white officer for shooting an undercover black officer, obviously, probably friendly fire, this case has nothing to do with race. Uh, from the George Zimmerman trial for uh, Trayvon Martin, uh, this case has nothing to do with race. Even the disorderly arrest case involving Henry Scoop, Skip Lewis Gates at Harvard, um, you know, the refrain was, this has nothing to do with race. And I think as probably everybody in this Zoom room knows, uh, <laughs> race has everything to do with everything. Um, and since I teach evidence, I will also sort of put out there that I often make the argument that we use race as evidence. Um, so I could talk more about that. Instead, what I'm going to talk about is sort of um, quickly one study, if you don't mind. Um, and I think everybody knows about implicit biases, but uh, this is a different study. And I like it because basically uh, the, the um, um, the people conducting the study gave um, 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 a story to mock participants um, about a confrontation um, and later on asked them to recall that story, to repeat what they had heard. And to the extent the story had a black participant in it, they would add acts of aggressiveness that were not in the original story. To the extent it had white participants, they would forget acts of aggression by the white participant. So we always see things through the lens of race. And again, you know, this sort of ties into implicit biases, but what I wanna to switch to is sort of the sort of historical connection because 
one of the criticism occasionally leveled with respect to implicit biases is it describes the present without actually explaining how we got here. It's not like we were all born with implicit biases. This takes centuries and centuries of work. So, you know, I think most of us in the room probably know that uh, after the Civil War, for example, there was a deliberate effort to depict Blacks as criminals. And, you know, part of this was done because it made it easier for the South to recreate slavery by another name since the 13th Amendment, which officially abolished slavery, sort of left a carve out as a punishment for a crime. The result was a host of black codes and peonage laws and convict laws and Jim Crow's laws that sort of were able to reassert sort of a racial hierarchy. But even before the Civil War, uh, there were slave codes that ensured race would matter in terms of punishment, even in terms of what was a crime. So I often tell students, you know, keep in mind that at the same time, it was not a crime for whites to hold humans in bondage or to rape them in order to increase their property. It was a crime for Blacks to move about freely, to gather in groups, or to possess weapons, or to own livestock. Um, in South Carolina, the state where I'm from, um, the Negro Code of 1735 even went so far as to specify what fabrics slaves were permitted to wear to make sure slaves did not address above their station. And all of these lo laws have afterlives in our present. Um, they all contribute to, you know, what Harvard historian Khalil Gibran Muhammad describes as writing crime into race. Um, so there's so much more I could say about this. It's like, we could talk about uh, the history of policing and slave patrols. It's like, basically, it's almost impossible to think about our criminal justice system without thinking about race, which always makes me a little bit uh, surprised when I hear people teaching criminal law and not discussing race at all. Sure. Well, thank you for that, Bennett. And actually, you, you know, you're making me think of this. There's a note case in in the Lee Harris textbook, which is which is what I use about a North Carolina case, right? And where, where the Supreme Court 1800s and, and the court says, well. Um, it, it was provocation for a, a free black person to speak in a certain way to a white man that mitigated the killing of the speaker, where it would not have been provocation had those same words been spoken by a white person, right? which sort of in, encapsulates that. And, and I mention that because it goes to this point that, that we were talking about the other day in our prep call. And, and, and so, can you talk about what, what you came into this conversation thinking? Because it, it's so interesting. Sure. Thank you, Pam. And let me echo all the thank yous from Bennett. And let me echo that I could just listen to Bennett talk about this all day. But I will, I will jump in here um, with what I think is a central tension in the fight for racial justice within the criminal justice system. And as Bennett mentioned, we're in the thick of it right now with the George Floyd trial, which is to say, there's one part of racial justice within the criminal justice system that says we need more rigorous defense and we need a radical shrinking of the criminal justice system. On the other hand, there are criminal trials, very few of them, but there are criminal trials of cops, one happening right now, where many of us would conceive of justice as a conviction, right? So there. I'm not saying this is an intractable tension. I think there are very specific ways that we can both shrink a racist criminal justice system and expect it to deliver us criminal justice in certain cases. So um, I, I do want us to get beyond the tension to the solutions, but I do think it is worth naming out loud that for many communities, um, we want both at the same time, and it's hard to know which to root for when. And, we just happen to be in, in such a trying time right now for race relations. Not only is Derek Chauvin's murder trial happening in Minnesota, but we're just coming out of the aftermath of Atlanta, where another community that um, has faced its own history of deep racism in America, but has also been lifted up as a model minority community. I'm talking about the Asian American community in Atlanta, who might also be thinking, well, justice for the killers of these six women um, in Atlanta can only look like a conviction and a harsh sentence for their killer. And there's a part of all of us that thinks that's true. And I hope that there's also a part of us that thinks that's not the be all end all. 
that's not true justice. Justice is reconfiguring these systems so radically that we never get there in the first place and that we don't so demean racial minorities in America and we reinvest in racial minorities in America such that we don't have to rely on this justice system as much at all. So like I said, I hope we can, um, I, I'm really looking forward to this discussion. I hope we can talk through some of the solutions to square this circle, um, but that's what I have on my mind right now. And if I could, if I could jump in again, uh, I would add to Samil's list uh, probably the 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 uh, the uh, riot or the uh, insurrection at, at the Capitol, uh, where I think a lot of people are like, okay, well, when is justice going to happen? But one thing I wonder about, and and Samil, I'm I'm wondering if you have thoughts about this. I I'm I'm wondering if it's possible for us to separate out. Uh, conviction from harsh punishment, because I could easily imagine a world where people are like, I want a conviction, but that does not necessarily mean life imprisonment or 30 years imprisonment. I mean, as a country, we incarcerate more than any other, <laughs> almost any other country in the world. Um, we don't have to punish as much as we do. We don't even have to punish in the way we do. We sort of assume prison as the default which to me has never made sense. And if I could just regurgitate something I was saying yesterday during our prep call, like the idea that um, for somebody who commits a hate crime, we are going to put that person in prison and assume that that person might come out not hating just seems strange. I mean, maybe if we just want, you know, if we're just bloodthirsty, we just want the person to suffer, that's one thing, but it seems like we're gonna, they're gonna end up suffering and then come out hating more. And I have to say, I feel the same way about a whole host of crimes, like the idea that we respond to domestic violence mm -hmm. by simply locking up abusers and thinking that will fix the problem just seems as like just that's absurd. Um, the same with, with rapists. I mean, these are all horrendous crimes, but I wonder if we could eventually reach a point where we think of other ways of addressing crime and also let's be honest, we, we don't spend enough time thinking about how to reduce crime in the first place. It's always sort of after the fact, how do we punish people? It's not like, how do we create systems where the crime isn't even happening? Well, and if I can jump in, I'll, I'll, I'll say as well that we, our, our rhetoric is always this either or, you're a defendant or a victim, right? The, the reality is, and I, and I think this is directly tied to the racist history of this country, right? The, to its original sin. The reality is, is that nobody is one or the other. Most people who are just as affected are both. And, and our, our unwillingness to, to embrace that duality, I think, is, is part of what drives the discomfort that we've been talking about. Yeah, so um, let me, yes and both of you, first of all, those are both really, really key points. Um, to, to Bennett's point about severing, finally, accountability from punishment. I think that's exactly what people want. I, I think we don't have nuanced and complex enough conversations about accountability without punishment. And I think people want that. People want a way to address harmful conduct without throwing lives away, right? Um, and I think to that point, people also want um, proportionate responses by government um, that focus resources where resources need to be focused. So, you know, one very interesting study that just came out over the last week and that's been setting the internet on fire is that 80% of America's criminal cases are misdemeanors. And now we have empirical proof from Suffolk County, Massachusetts, that choosing not to prosecute those misdemeanors actually reduces the chance of follow on implication in the criminal justice system. And that speaks to Professor Bennett's point that simply involving someone in this system makes them more prone to harmful conduct later. How, as a prosecutor, as a police officer, can you know that information and then still choose to prosecute a low-level crime? I don't know. And I hope that, I, I doubt, but I hope police departments and prosecutors' offices around the country are really internalizing um, this data that the choice is not prosecute first and then decide how much to punish later. It might be do not prosecute in the first place. And, and I think that's where the conversation needs to go. 
So I'm going to tag in here just to say that, you know, the, the focus on misdemeanors is so interesting because, of course, most of those misdemeanors, again, have their origins in post-Civil War laws that were designed, right, to create a slave workforce, right, under the 13th Amendment. And, and there is a direct line there. The, the other thing I'll say, though, and I want I want to push on this a little bit, maybe I'm just less less optimistic than you are, but I'm not convinced that if you give communities the choice, um, that, that they won't ask for harsher punishments, that they won't be looking for um, longer jail sentences. We've all seen the way public opinion gets driven by, by kind of anti-crime hysteria. And quite frankly, with the change in the way we're keeping crime statistics now, I think we can anticipate a lot of elevated rhetoric about crime increases that may not be real. Um, what do you guys think? So, so I, I will say that I suspect communities, sh you're absolutely right, Pam. You know, there's not agreement. And, you know, if you go into communities, even communities that uh, sort of face disproportionate policing and say, what do you think about defund the police? What do you think about abolish the police? You're not going to get sort of the same rhetoric that you're getting from sort of the, you know, the, the let's just say the elite. Um, but that being said, I suspect, and I would like to hope, that communities are actually similar to people. So studies show that when you go to actual victims and say, do you want, to, do you want this person prosecuted or not? The answer is, well, yeah, I want the person prosecuted. But if you go to that same victim and say, well, here are a menu of options. Um, you know, which do you want? And you could also pick other, <laughs> so you could come up with your own option. What would make you whole? Then we would be surprised that so many victims actually want something other than incarceration because they know incarceration is not gonna make them whole. And I think it's probably often true with communities. I mean, certainly with James Foreman's book, Locking Up Our Own, which sort of makes the argument that in DC, at least in a, lo in a lot of areas, people, black people were pushing for tough drug laws but they were also asking for lots of other things as well, like better jobs, better housing. And the response of the federal government was, here's money for policing. And to what extent do we start to just internalize like that's the only option? You know, I mean, it's, it's um... so I'm gonna mention two other things, if I may. Um, and, and as I get older, they troubled me and they did not trouble me when I was younger. Um, it troubles me as I get older that um, in so many communities, 911 is the default for everything. So no matter what happens, you call 911. And those of us who live in like privileged communities, <laughs> we don't call, when I, mean, I have a dispute with a neighbor, which I have, you know, it's like, okay, who's threatening a lawsuit? It's not like you call 911 and involve the police, um, just because I live in a sort of privileged community. Um, the other thing I will say is, you know, sort of a mea culpa. I've, I've been teaching what criminal law for, I'm not going to say how many years, because I don't want to say how old I am. But for the longest, I, I, I taught criminal law, um, you know, we teach the rationales for punishment, and then it'd be like, the rest of the semester, you know, well, how much time do you think this person deserves? There was never a question like, well, does the person deserve time at all? Or why are we even saying time? <laughs> you know, it was just taken as a given. So as I get older, I'm actually much more conflicted about even teaching criminal law. Like how do we teach criminal law without sort of legitimizing a system that is deeply flawed? Yeah, Salma? Yeah, I think I will, I will only add that, Pam, you're, you couldn't be more right that we shouldn't we shouldn't um, fetishize community as, as some sort of panacea, right? After all, communities voted for the representatives who passed all of the very harsh laws that we're now living under, right? Um, of both parties, um, or at least stood by and let those folks pass those laws for years and years and years before we had an awakening. That said, um, at least communities will be more diverse and bring a wider. Uh, set of experiences than the current law enforcement infrastructure. Um, you know, you go into any DA's office in America and that place is white and male. Um, and so any amount of diversity you can bring into this conversation, I think can only help. And one small piece of proof there is that the, the district attorneys doing the most good on, on the racial 
bias front and ending mass, mass incarceration front are progressive black female prosecutors, right? Now, that doesn't mean we have to put all our eggs in the progressive prosecutor basket. There's plenty to talk about there, but the people doing the absolute best, most cutting edge work are black women who came from those same exact communities that James Foreman is talking about, where yes, of course they acknowledge the need for protection. They're not out to abolish law enforcement entirely, but they know the cyclical nature of the criminal justice system and they know it's racist underpinnings. So they know where to focus their efforts, as I was saying earlier. So that's one modicum of hope, I think. So I'm gonna ask you guys, um, what's the first step? We have lots of ideas about what's wrong, we have lots of thoughts. If you could change one thing, what would it be? Boy, there's a lot of silence. Y'all can't see my Zoom screen, but uh, these guys are looking at me like I've sprouted two heads. All right, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, Bennett. Uh, there, I, I, I'm going to resist the notion, resist the temptation to mention one thing because the whole system is flawed. Um, I mean, one thing we've seen time and time again is you fix one little thing and something else pops up. It's like whack a mole or something. Um, uh, the system. Um, so Paul Butler wrote an article with the title, I might be paraphrasing it, but I think this is right. It's something like the system is working exactly the way it's supposed to. Um, um, and, it's, it's, and, and his point was, um, we are seeing all these flaws. These flaws um, are not bugs. They are actually features of it. So even going back to the earlier conversation, some mill mentioned about misdemeanors and how that sort of is counterproductive. <laughs> um, uh, one response, and it might be a cynical response, might be, well, is it really counterproductive? Is the school to prison pipeline counterproductive? Or is that sort of a way to sort of facilitate and enable sort of a, a sort of a racial underclass? Um, you know, one critical race theory question that I, I, I love asking in a lot of my scholarship is whenever we have any kind of particular law, uh, we always have to ask like who benefits from it and who does not. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. Um, and uh, well, we, I'm just going to point out someone wrote in our um, in our chat, and I'm going to throw this out because this really does um, follow up on what Bennett just said. Um, you know, becoming a prosecutor to help resolve unfairness in the criminal justice system is like enlisting in the army because you're opposed to the war. And that, of course, is a quote from Paul Butler. Um, and of course, you know, Paul's evolved on this, I, I have to say, right? His thinking on this has evolved. Um, but there is this question about the role of prosecutors. It, we're going to have a whole conversation about it, but we, we have come back to that a lot. Um, so I, I want to see if you guys have a reaction to that before I, I put, put Somo back on the spot again. Sure. Um, I, I'll say that um, I differ with at least Paul's original premise um, that we cannot do good from the inside, at least as the system is currently constituted. And I don't believe that it's a zero sum game between harm reduction via smart, progressive, thoughtful, compassionate people becoming prosecutors now, and those of us outside the system shrinking it um, to the point where it can do less and less harm over time. Uh, and so, uh, and that, you know, you have two former prosecutors on this call, so uh, maybe others would have different views, but um, having been there and actually having been a misdemeanor prosecutor, um, I know that my decision making meant more in that system than what outside actors were telling the system to do. Now that's a problem and I quit because I had too much power. Um, but that is reality. And so um, I think we can walk and chew gum at the same time. So, so I will just add, uh, prosecutors. And I think one of the, one of the joys of being a law professor is I can write things that are never going to happen. Um, but uh, it was basically making an argument that we should just get rid of prosecutors and return power back to the people. Um, because I think if we did that, we would actually find us uh, find ourselves in a better place.
Um, it would sort of, you know, assist the whole Paul Butler problem altogether. Just get rid of prosecutors. There you go. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, discretion being the better part of valor, I'm gonna go back to asking, what's the one thing you would do, someone? Yeah, um, uh, <laughs> unlike Professor Capers, I can't fight the hypothetical. I will, I'll try to answer the question. Um, but I, I think it's to shrink the system as much as humanly possible. Now that's basically all answers in one, so it's also a cop out. But um, I think that achieves many of the solutions that we're trying to get at here, which is to avoid the unintended consequences of sim simply moving deck chairs around on the Titanic, right? Is to reduce the amount of interactions between law enforcement and, and the polity, um, while also freeing up resources and brain space for more creative solutions to underlying root causes. So, um, you know, that's obviously the devil's in the details, but I think rather than coming up with one-off policy solutions here and there, I think we need to um, just just rejigger the entire approach to human welfare uh, at, the, at the state and local levels. You know, I think often about the argument that, that part of the reason that the system works the way it's supposed to without consequences that on that system, right, is because we have so dis, and we've disengaged the consequences of the system from the people who, who are making it run. So in other words, communities aren't asked to bear the cost of incarcerating people. Um, and to the extent that they do in the local jail, they don't see it. They're not, it's not transparent that they are choosing, right, policing over hospitals or policing over schools or, you know, and the downsizing that we're talking about, there is this trend, right, that downsizing means less incarceration, right? But what we're seeing is, you know, the devil in the details, we're seeing an increase in the surveillance state. Now, this is not the kind of surveillance that Bennett talks about in, in well, maybe a little bit, but this is the surveillance state that has everybody on an ankle monitor, um, everybody, you know, pinging into their parole or probation officer. And that also, is very, very reflective in a, in a really visceral way, right, of the legacy of slavery. I mean, I don't think there's any way to separate that image of someone walking around with a cuff on their ankle, right, and having to report into somebody, you know, jump and say how high. What do we, what do, we do with, or how do we talk about um, bringing people to say, as, as you both, I think, have suggested, enough this, this, whatever this offense is, it doesn't matter enough to, to our community, to our sense of justice, to lock this person up, to have them on a monitor, whatever it is. Pam, I don't know if this quite directly answers the, the question, but I hope it, it at least uh, responds to it. I think one way of getting people to sort of say enough is enough is to actually get people to actually see what's going on. Um, so when you talk about, you know, we don't, you know, we, we don't internalize the cost. I mean, most, most prisoners, we just wipe them out of our minds, they become invisible. At the same time, uh, stuff that we, other stuff that we really should know, like we most people don't. Like I think most Americans would be surprised that for every three homicides, police only solve two. <laughs> and you know, if, when I tell that to people, they're like they're thinking like, oh, you know, probably inner city homicides. It's like no, in the suburbs. <laughs> you know, you know, if you're killed by your spouse, yeah, that crime gets solved. If you're killed by somebody else, like chances are the that crime just doesn't get solved. So obviously, it's the same with property crimes. Probably everybody on the Zoom call has had something stolen. You report it to the police and the police shrug their shoulders. There's just, I think one thing we could do is sort of resolve the disconnect between what police focus on, um, which goes back to Samil's point about the misdemeanors and things that don't matter, and what we really should care about, uh, which are actual crimes. And then if we could also sort of ratchet down the punishment for those crimes at the same time, uh, you know, then we would at least be heading in the right direction. Well, thank you. So we have a couple of really interesting questions that have come in. Um, one is, is goes back to this question, I, I think of kind of the baby steps, right, that, that we go through. And, and the question is, as we're working for reform, 
What are your thoughts on diversion programs, problem solving courts, and victor offender, medi offender mediation programs? Is investing in those a distraction or is it worthy? And do you think we learned anything from the initial pretrial jail reduction seen immediately after the pandemic? So I'm gonna suggest we break those into chunks because I think the pandemic question probably merits a separate conversation. But, uh, you know, I think the three of us have talked a little bit about this, right? I'm, I'm a problem solving court skeptic. Um, and uh, I think the data support the idea when we know that people who succeed at drug court do really, really well. We know that the vast majority of people who don't succeed at drug court do far, far worse than they would have had we never intervened in, in, with a specialty program, right? I think it speaks to a point of the services should come to you whether or not you get arrested. But I'll, I'll let you guys respond as well. Yeah, I, I will wholeheartedly agree with that assessment. Now, the notion that we are trying to pair accountability for some small amount of harm. Now, let's be clear, um, most of the cases that end up in these sort of alternative uh, diversion programs are the kind that are small enough that we should probably just let go entirely, right? Um, but to the extent that there is some amount of societal harm that we want accountability for, and we identify um, underlying root causes that we also don't want to entirely ignore, right? Because one consequence of no longer prosecuting misdemeanors, we have to admit, is that we may never identify people with problems, right? And that we do genuinely want to fix. So I, I will, I'll give credit to the notion of drug courts in that we want state intervention at some level to help people feel both accountable for some amount of harm and to help people. We're just doing it all wrong, right? And we're attaching it to punishment rather than, than mutual aid. And therefore, let's just shift the entire concept of it out of the criminal justice system and much earlier into somebody's life where it can actually make a difference and they never have to get in touch with a system that we know can harm them worse than whatever was happening to them before. Yes, everything that was just said, I will I will second. I I it troubles me that uh, for so many of these uh, drug courts and alternatives, it's involving the criminal system at all. Like that just seems absurd. I would be fine with um, alternatives if we could just bypass the criminal system altogether. These do not seem like criminal issues. I should also say, Pam, that. Um, so for the record, in case the audience is curious, um, I used to describe myself as um, abolitionist curious, but I think I'm quickly just becoming a full on abolitionist. Um, so these alternatives um, are already problematic, as you can imagine. And in the abolitionist literature, they sort of talk about the difference between reformist reforms versus non-reformist reforms, and I can never get straight which is which. I think, I think the reformist reforms are supposed to be the bad ones because they're reforms that, you know, make changes at the margins, but they're not downsizing the carceral system. Um, so to the extent that any um, drug court alternative or any alternative. Um, sure, they might not, people might not be going to prison, but they're still getting marked and they're still getting traced and they're still getting surveilled. So for me, um, you know, that's still a negative. Well, thank you for those comments, guys. I want, I want to go to the other part of that question, which was um, the, the, the question was asking for some reaction to what we saw in the post pandemic pretrial jail reduction. Um, and for folks on the call who may not be familiar with this phenomenon, there was a really significant decrease in pretrial detention at the beginning of the pandemic. It did not stay that way, right? We, we in fact saw numbers bounce up and in some curious ways, that's probably worth its own webinar, particularly given the pretty wild fluctuations in, in patterns. We saw urban to rural, different locations. But, but definitely something's going on, right? When suddenly there's a pandemic and pretrial populations plummet, and at least in some places I've looked at, a lot of the folks going in were violations, not new offenders. Um, they were warrants that police would execute and then roll the person back out, that stopped. What are y'all's thoughts about 
that issue and, and in particular, let's try and tie that to this pervasive issue of racial justice that we see in the healthcare system, right? Who gets sick and who gets vaccinated and who has access to healthcare? So Bennett, you're being gestured to, your turn. I was gonna defer. I, I, I don't feel that I know enough. I can speculate that, I mean, my sense is uh, in New York, at least initially, you just had a court slowdown and a police slowdown. So that might be why some of the numbers dropped initially. Um, and then I would speculate that numbers probably went back up in part because uh, along with COVID, you had um, not only was COVID disproportionately affecting racial minorities, um, but obviously that sort of um, correlated with a uh, desperate impact economically in terms of job loss, which actually in turn leads to economic crime, you know, um, the things that could land you back in, in jail. So um, yeah, I, I wish I knew more about it. I, I'm afraid I don't. I would love to know more. I would love to know your thoughts, Pam. <laughs> well, I, I'm never shy, but let me, let me, let, let me let someone else speak first. <laughs> Well, well, I'll say that um, Professor Capers, uh, unsurprisingly, speculated correctly. So I've been a part of, you know, litigation to get folks out of jails and prisons on account of COVID for the last year. And the phenomenon that you described, Pam, is exactly right, um, that initially um, wardens and sheriffs told on themselves because they listened to the science and started taking in far fewer people and releasing far more people, um, I guess hoping that the pandemic would be a temporary thing and then they could fill the jails right back up again. Um, it turned out not to be a temporary thing, but they did fill the jails right back up again. And you are right that the pervasive racial disparities in healthcare in the United States doubled on themselves and then were showing up in the, in the intakes into jails and prisons because of course, um, poor black and brown people were less able to shelter in place and just ride this thing out. And so they got picked up in higher numbers. And so, yes, we are seeing now jail numbers go right back up to the, what they were pre-pandemic, except in places where DAs and sheriffs actually took this data to heart. And speaking of you know black female progressive prosecutors, Baltimore is one example where Marilyn Mosby um, was able to keep jail numbers as far down as she could and realized that you can keep it that way. And so she's keeping it that way. Um, and so I think, I think there is a kernel of hope in the, in the awfulness that is COVID and the, and the, and the double awfulness that was COVID in detention centers, which is if we want to listen, there is proof that the sky will not fall and you can cut jail populations significantly and strike a real blow for racial justice. So let me ask you both though this, and it's something I don't think we know the answer yet, but I think a lot about the money problem in the context of COVID, right? Because on the one hand we have backlogs and we can talk about backlogs. I mean, I can talk about backlogs, you know, what we saw in Katrina, right? The, the nonsense people were sitting in jail for. But one of the things that, that we've been talking about in criminal justice over the last five, 10 years now is the pervasive burden of fines and fees and the fact that they are inflicted on people, mostly poor people, as a way of sustaining the existence of the very court system that, that's essentially oppressing them, right? It, it, it's a very, very vicious cycle. And I, I, I have been worrying, and I'd be curious to hear your thoughts, that one outcome of the pandemic may be increased pressure to collect fines and fees because as, as a, judge who I used to appear in front of used to say, well, Ms. Metzger, the court's got to eat. Um, and if the court's got to eat, I can tell you on whose backs that's going to be. What happens then? And I mean, besides people suffering, I, I really would love to know how we take advantage of this moment rather than losing it to the press to, to keep the money flowing. I don't expect anybody to have any answers, but I would love some thoughts. I mean, someone you've been doing this litigation, you and Jason have been out there. What, what are you seeing? Yeah, um, it, it is true. We can't let um, this become yet another opportunity to stick people in the kind of cycles of poverty that we know drive a lot of the system. Uh, and so again, I think the easy answer is shrink that system, starve the system, right? So what if the court can't eat? 
uh, the court is fat and bloated and <laughs> needs to go on a diet. I'm sorry to torture this analogy, but um, so I think, um, you know, that that's sort of the policy prescription. And I think there is certainly a litigation angle here. You have seen an explosion in Bearden style cases being brought across the system, right? And I think those can be and have been largely successful, particularly in the pretrial bail um, and fines and fees area. Um, not as much in felony disenfranchisement, particularly in Florida, but it ought to be. And I think that's still an argument worth making to make sure that people can re-enter um, and vote and do other, uh, do other of their civic duties that we promised them that they should be able to do after they've quote unquote paid their debt, but their debt keeps piling up. So, so I think uh, as, a, as a first order solution, shrink the system, second order, you know, be out there fighting because I, I know that courts aren't often our salvation, but there are particular principles like equal protection and not discriminating on poverty that are still really viable if we, if we do it right. And, and the only thing I'll mention is an observation I actually heard from somebody else a few days ago where they were just observing that it's sort of interesting that slavery was sort of like based on using racial minorities as capital to sort of prop up the capital of the South. And now so many jurisdictions are again using racial minorities to prop up their capital. Well, and, and there's a question in the in the chat from Robert Dinaj, and I'll, I'll call him out and just say that um, he was a chaplain at the BOP, Federal Bureau of Prisons for many, many years. And he's a friend of the center. And, um, you know, he, he he mentions that a former BOP colleague said to him, crime pays and it pays good, um, meaning for the corrections team, right? And so his question is, um, can y'all speak about the prison industrial complex that's capitalized, right? And how it fuels our economy. Sure, I, I forced Bennett to take the first salvo too many times, so I'll, I'll start. Um, yes, uh, there, there is no question that our entire prison system is for profit in many, many ways, right? I think we do get hung up a little bit on the private prison system, uh, although you know most of us in the game know that that only makes up of less than 10% of the system, but that the profit motive exists across all of our prison systems, including public prison systems. There are contractors and there are uh, you know, culinary providers and there are staff and there are um, you know, medical staff. Uh, and, and, and surveillance systems and phone call systems, right? I mean, uh, it is as pervasive as the military industrial complex, is, it's as disparate, right? So that every jurisdiction has a reason to keep it going. Um, and, and so, you know, I'm, I'm gonna sound like a broken record, but, but the solution is, is to, uh, well, I mean, there are specific solutions to reduce their, um, their profit motive, right? Turn more of these uh, systems back over to the state. I think there are litigation solutions like make them more amenable to suit by by le by le legislation um, and also get rid of most of them. So one thing I, I, I'm, I, I think I'm embarrassed to say that whenever I hear like uh, how little prisoners make an hour or, you know, how much it costs them to make a phone call or how much it costs them to, you know, I guess buy soap like I. I I, I'm I'm shocked, and I shouldn't be shocked as somebody who's been involved in like the criminal justice system for like well over a decade. And I keep thinking, well, if I'm shocked, I wonder like, do most Americans even know this, or do they just not care? Like, it's you know, like the the I was listening to a radio program recently where you know former inmates were saying they get paid 14 cents an hour. <laughs> And that to make a phone call, you know, they have to like work, like basically it's 10 hours of work for like to make a two minute phone call, which <laughs> just seems absurd. And, and then, you know, part of the rationale, it's a disgusting rationale, but part of the rationale is, oh, it's okay, we're giving you life skills that you can then use when you get out. But then of course we have collateral consequences that don't let people have the very jobs that they train for as we saw with the wildfires in California. So it's a total catch 22. And if you weren't sure that it was for profit, all you need to do is look at what happened during the pandemic. So we've been running this program with volunteers from all over the country who've been helping us collect local criminal justice policies, right? Not what's happening, not, not, not what the governor says should happen, but pulling what's actually happening at the county level. 
and the number of places that have announced that because of COVID, everyone's going to get free video calls because they can't get family visits in the jail, or they're going to reduce the number of, they're going to reduce the cost and increase the number and increase the access. And, and what it tells you is one, this isn't security motivated, right? It might be a nice convenience. And there are many, look, there are many, many people who are incarcerated whose families cannot travel to see them, who benefit from making those technologies available. But the extortionate cost, right, of those contacts, particularly for people who are going to be re-entering where we ought to be fostering relationships, tells you, I think, everything you need to know about this disparate profit-making enterprise. And again, I, I think we have to keep coming back to it. It is a disparate profit-making enterprise that profits primarily off the backs of black and brown people. Right? Um, yeah, and Anna, I, I'll just add one more point. I mean, this was happening in New York State where and maybe it happened lots of states, but in New York State, we basically had prisoners making hand sanitizer um, for, for, for the public. Um, you know, and um, obviously prohibited um, prisoners them from having access to hand sanitizer yeah, sure. because, People. you know, it was some kind of security risk. Um, so it was just like lots of things like that. Yeah, and one of the rationale for not ha letting them have say, hand sanitizers is because it had alcohol in it, and God forbid they might drink it uh, when we're all sitting outside in COVID and the only way we can cope is drinking. So it seemed kind of unfair. Yeah, well, and we've had and places where prisoners are making masks and don't have them, right? Um, we're not drinking the masks, but yeah. Um, so we, I'm going to switch tacks a little bit because we've had um, a question that takes us all the way back to Paul Butler, um, which was about jury nullification and whether that's an, an, a, an effective approach to change. Um, thoughts? Sure. Uh, yes. I mean, you know, I think professors in the room probably know that the only right in the Constitution that's named both in the text and the amendments is the right to a jury trial, right? Um, and so before we even get to nullification, I think we have to recognize the fact that 95 plus percent of convictions come via plea bargain and plea bargaining is the driver of mass incarceration that nobody really talks about and allows us to disproportionately incarcerate black and brown people because they come from communities and come from means that don't allow them to fight the coercive nature of plea bargaining. And so I think that is uh, an extremely worthwhile topic. Uh, um, and for those cases that do end up going to trial, yes, jury nullification is kind of the point. Allowing the jury to be a citizen check on government overreach is a feature. It's supposed to be a feature, not a bug. That's why we built in jury uh, juries in the first place. So um, if, if that requires more nullification, so be it. But I think um, we'd have to actually have a system of trials for that to matter. So let's talk about plea bargaining too. Yeah. Bennett? And, and, and I will add, uh, not only do we need a system of trials, but, you know, and, and you guys can correct me on the jurisprudence. But my understanding is, yeah, we all have this right to jury nullification, but uh, there's no right for us to know that we have this right. So if a defense lawyer actually even tries to suggest jury nullification, mm -hmm. the judge can slap that defense lawyer down, can create, can declare a mistrial. Um, you know, if a judge on his or her own suggests jury nullification, the prosecutor can seek a writ of mandamus, at least in the federal system. So it's, it's so bizarre we have this right, and yet we don't want people to know about this right. And my guess is that also has racial consequences in terms of who knows about what rights they have. Um, you know, clearly people who have law degrees and are more educated and, um, you know, are, are more privy to what rights they could exercise even as jurors. So I'm going to push back a little bit and I'm going to say this. Whenever I talk to my first year criminal law class about nullification, because I take a little dip into procedure, right? Um, one of the things I say is, is there's, there's nullification that we like and there's nullification that we don't like. And um, nullification is also an acquittal in the Zimmerman case, I think. I think grand jury nullification, right, Eric Garner. Um, and so I think we have to be really thoughtful about nullification. And it may be that it's still OK in the sense that it is a signaling to people who thought that things were fine, right, 
an acquittal of George Zimmerman, I think, is a signal. And maybe nullification's value has to be in its signal, even if we don't like its outcomes. In other words, it, its expressive content, regardless of whether we like the outcome, would have to be valued. But I think it's, it's, it's always been important to me to highlight that piece, because I, I think a lot of the history of the civil rights movement has been federal response to discriminate what, what, what my former colleague Tanya Tetlow calls discriminatory acquittals, mm-hmm. right? These are nullifications too. So, so Pamela, I could not agree with you more. And one of my criticisms of, of Paul's piece, uh, racialized racial jury nullification, is that sure that might be a possibility in D.C., which is majority minority. It's 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 practically an impossibility anyplace else because blacks. Latinos are going to be the minority on a jury. At most, you're going to get a hung verdict, which means the prosecutor can try the case again. And guess what the prosecutor is going to do next go around? The prosecutor is going to use his or her peremptories Uh um, to strike more and more jurors of color. So I'm going to switch gears again because we have a question that switches gears. We've talked about prosecutors. We've talked about police. We've talked about corrections. This question um, asks um, about a quote from Charlie Gerstein, who's at the Civil Rights Corps. Um, and, and Charlie said, the American criminal system suffers not only from the problem of underdog underfunding, but also from another perhaps deeper problem that ample public defense funding cannot solve. And his question is, are public defenders complicit in many ways in, in the injustice in our system? And um, I have thoughts, but I'll let you guys go first. So I, I take Charlie's question, um, and Charlie is a, is a brilliant partner of ours in, in a lot of cases, but I cannot in good faith use the word complicit. Public defenders are our last bastion of defense between an oppressive system and often racial minorities, but everybody under the thumb of the government. Um, so of course, to the extent that public defenders are drawing public money that is used within the criminal justice system, will we ultimately want to shrink their role as well? But that's only as a byproduct of shrinking a punishment system that we don't want. And I think public defenders themselves will be happy to go become computer programmers and ballet dancers if we have achieved that ultimate goal. But to say that their mere existence now before that's true is complicity, I can't go that far. So, you know, I, I, I wrestle with this, my students wrestle with this, especially my students who think of themselves as abolitionists, but they're looking to become public defenders. Um, I have to say, I've, 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 I, I'm, I, I can't come as easily to the conclusion that SOMO came to. I think it's, for me, I, I, because I'm a, you know, because I could just imagine a whole different world and there are no consequences to me because I'm just an academic, you know, I can fantasize about a world where every public defender says tomorrow, I quit. And what would happen to the system? Would we still incarcerate people? Or would that just expose, you know, would that be enough to disrupt the system? You know, so I don't know, to me, if, if you're a public prosecutor, you're still part of the system. You might be fighting against it, but you're still part of it. You're still in the game. Um, so it is what it is. So I'm going to I'm going to weigh in here and I guess I'm going to say two things. First of all, yes, shrink the system. And this is the challenge of the parity conversations, right? You want to talk about pay parity and resource parity for defenders. And my response is, you know, how about taking some of those resources away from law enforcement and prosecutors, not to punish them, right? But but to turn it into a system that works better for communities rather than shoring everything up to kind of escalate the litigation or the plea bargaining arms war in one point. Two, I think there are what I'm going to call soft spots where public defenders are complicit in ways they don't know. We can talk about implicit bias. We can talk about some of the studies analogizing, you know, defender responses to the same kinds of issues that we see in doctor responses, right? A kind of a disregard of the feelings and inputs and frankly, the choices of people of color. We can talk about that. But I want to say, I, I, I think I've lived through about as close as you can live through to having no public defenders and no defenders, right? Having been through Katrina, 
And I'll tell you that on the one hand, Bennett, you're right. It changes the system, right? It pulls back the curtain. You see all the dirty laundry. Um, but, you know, that was 2005. In 2000, well, 2021, um, there's been an awful lot of backsliding in, in the public defender community in New Orleans and Louisiana, not because of the defenders, but because of the legislative funding and all of, all of the um, Cadillac system of justice comments you hear, you know, we, we don't have to give you a Cadillac, a Buick is just fine. Um, the idea that, you know, you could have a defender strike, um, Kim Taylor Thompson has written about this, right? You know, the challenge with those things is that the, the strike, and, and I've, it leaves the very people who you're charged with defending unrepresented. And so it's this question of the big picture, right? Could you, could you crash the system? Of course, right? But on whose backs? It's not going to be my back. It's going to be the back of the person I'm not standing up for. Um, and, and I think the balance that good defenders hit, in my opinion, is that when they cannot do their job in a way that makes them anything other than a cover for injustice, right? When what they're doing is checking the box so that there's no appeal, then it's your job to sit your ass down and not participate. But I, I think my, my own wrestling with this has been that, that the luxury of saying no, the luxury of going on strike, I'm not talking about the too many cases litigations, but the luxury of saying the system is corrupt, I ain't playing. It, it is exactly that. It's an elitist luxury. And, and this brings me to something that you said yesterday, Bennett, a question you asked, which is, is abolition elitist? Yes. I mean, I, 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 I uh, recently uh, asked my, uh, so last semester I, I taught a seminar where I had 20 students and probably 18 of them described themselves as abolitionist. Um, it, well, this is New York, Pam. Uh, so, uh, and the other thing, um, uh, uh, you know, in my seminar, there were uh, plenty of people who'd been victims of crime. Um, uh, um, you know, when we talked about uh, sexual assault, it was uh, sort of, um, I was surprised by how many students um, had been victims of sexual assault. And yet again, the majority um, were abolitionist, um, um, which I found interesting. And I sort of pressed them on it and sort of asked, you know, well, are you ever concerned that you know <laughs> you're being elitist? And they they all had responses. Um, and um, I, I have to be honest, I was not entirely convinced by their responses because their responses still sounded. Well, you know, when you speak to people and explain to people, <laughs> you know, then they will see that, you know, you know, abolition is the right thing. So it, it was in a way paternalistic, but I think that's unavoidable. I mean, I think that's unavoidable. I mean, I, I mean, what can we do if we're not trying to sort of share our knowledge and our, our information with other people and try to persuade them? Um, so I think as long as we're trying to persuade people, instead of sort of telling them what's best for them, um, then maybe that's fine. Yeah, I think, Bennett, you hit it on the head right at the end there. And to the extent that we're speaking to uh, an audience of, of law students and uh, aspiring, you know, public interest lawyers, let me just put two fine points on it. One, regardless of your uh, theoretical orientation, have a plan. How are we going to get to the level of incarceration or criminal justice that you want, be it zero or 10% or 90% of the current capacity? Um, that's what I want to know. And secondly, um, as Bennett just said, involve the people whom you want to help. It, it's elitist because we talk about it in panels like this, and we don't go consult the people that we're trying to help. And, and speaking of complicity, I the ACLU, other organizations are complicit in that um, sort of habit of, of top-down solution making. So if you have a plan and your plan has, has legitimately involved the inputs of the people you're trying to help, then, then we can get somewhere concrete. And if the place that you want to go is abolition and you've done those two things, amen, let's go. And if it's not, amen, let's go. But at least we're going with 
something actionable and something that'll really help people. So follow on to that. Um, some, someone's asked, okay, you want to give it back to the people. How are you going to get around exactly what we started with, which are the people's biases, the people's racism, the people's kind of investment at, at every possible level, right, in either the benefits of institutionalized racism um, or the blinders in terms of capacity and potential and change that, that, you, that people live with because of institutionalized racism. I'm getting, I'm getting a lot of how-tos. Yeah, so I think this speaks to the holistic approach that we've been talking about throughout, right? And walking and chewing gum at the same time. I don't think anybody has given up on eliminating systemic racism in America. I just think that we know it's going to be hard and it's going to take um, real tough conversations and, and, and people seeing in very bright light the, the history of racism in America, right? But, but uh, I haven't given up. And I think that smart people can have learn how to teach people uh, or, or and unlearn the racism that we have uh you know forcing through our veins such that we have a society that is as stripped as possible of institutional racism while we um undertake these you know little tweaks to the system criminal yeah for me pam this sort of uh goes back to your question about well what's the one fix and there is no for me there's no one fix they're like you know so much is broken um and as i was listening to your question i was just becoming depressed <laughs> second, more depressed second by second but then at the end at the end pam i thought of you know my students and i became optimistic again because i i have to say i mean if change is going to happen, I think it's, it's happening with uh, this current generation. So it used to be that the start of crim law or the start of crim pro, I would ask my class, like, oh, by the way, you know, do any of you want to be prosecutors? Do any of you want to be defense lawyers? And, you know, how many of you are just taking this because it's mandatory or on the bar exam? Um, recently, I've started adding and asking another question. How many of you want to change the system? And I've been so uh sort of pleasantly um happy with the response where it's like i and i don't know if it's because of george floyd and what happened this summer maybe um but uh at least this year um easily you know 90 to 95 percent of my students had no problem sort of saying like we want to change the system yeah you know it's interesting you say that about generations because i'm now at a point where i'm old enough to say there are other generations behind me right and um, a couple of years ago, when I first started at the Decent Center, I had the pleasure of, of having Brittany Barnett work with us part-time. Part and two things struck me about y'all's comments when I was thinking about it. One, she was on a fellowship that was half with us, half with Cut 50, an organization that has a specific vision, cut mass incarceration by 50%, right? I mean, it's got, it's got an articulable goal, a measurable goal. Two, Brittany came to me very early on and said, I want to start a project that focuses on um, ending life in prison without parole for people charged with nonviolent federal drug crimes. I want to build a campaign around this. And I looked at her and I said, nobody's going to care. You're right. It's outrageous. Nobody's going to care. Trust me. Nobody cares about those people, but you and me and a handful of lawyers who've represented them and their families. That's it. Nobody cares. And um, boy, was I wrong, right? She's built this amazingly successful campaign. And I'm not just talking about her clemency work, right? Or her book, which is you know now an Amazon bestseller, but I'm talking about the people that she and her colleagues are bringing out of jail, right? Bringing out of prisons, and about the fact that in all of her work, she is a co-founder, right, or a co-producer of the work with formerly incarcerated people, right? And she herself, you know, her 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 background in this is is as the child of an incarcerated black mother, right, from a rural place in Texas, and so I think. You know, the, my only answer to my own question would be, you know, stop thinking you know all the answers and be a little more courageous, right? Um, but but I think I think those are all points really well taken about about hope and change. I'm not trying entirely to harken back to Obama, but um, hope and change would be an, a lovely way to kind of wrap up this conversation. Um, what what does come next for judges because someone's tapped in and said you, you've asked talked about pretty much everything except judges um 
thoughts about about the role of judges and I'm thinking particularly about the kind of um, again the, the layers of systemic institutionalized racism both in the electoral judges system and the appointed judicial system and and how we go after that um, with the caveat that that the judge who told me that the court's got to eat is a person of color, right? I mean, I don't think that judges are immune um, to, to falling into these traps based on the color of their skin. Yeah, I mean, I think judges of any player in the criminal justice system are sort of taking the most calcified path, right, of privilege upon privilege upon privilege. And so I think here's where pipeline becomes a real important factor and um, investing in the communities that can then get folks in the pipeline who never have been will naturally sort of result in judges who think a different way. Not naturally, it'll actually be really hard work to do that. But, um, but I hope that, uh, that that's the way to, to fix it long term. And in the short term, in our beloved city of New Orleans, in Houston, we've seen that electorally you can change things very quickly. Um, you know, entire slates of black female judges getting elected to criminal courts and immediately getting rid of cash bail and doing the other things that, you know, legislatures can't or won't do, prosecutors can't or won't do, right? So, um, so I think as long as we're stuck with the electoral system, which I hate for the judiciary branch, at least let's go use it to our advantage. Okay. Instead of answering the question, I'd, I'd love to extend it because I've often wondered, like, you know, I, I would be curious to hear your response as to how do, how is a judge or a public defender or a prosecutor um, um, able to stay the course and not become corrupted or captured by the system. Like, it seems to me like that almost seems inevitable. So, I mean, I, you know, there's a whole conversation we could have about court work, courtroom working groups, right? Which I think are a, a, almost an inevitable formula for corruption, right? Um, if not kind of financial corruption for kind of um, role corruption within the adversary system as it exists. But again, you want to talk about elitist um, courtroom working groups are the only thing you have in rural communities all across the United States, in tribal communities all across the country and, and in their tribal nations. So I don't think we can just leave it there and say, you know, well, ro rotate people around and that'll be fine. I don't I don't have great answers to, to the question you asked, which is really the question you asked is really why do people sometimes suck? Right. Um, I mean, it, it's it's how do we stop people? Um, from falling into the, the traps that their power lays for them. Um, and a good dose of reality never hurts and maybe term limits never hurt, but I don't have any solutions there. Yeah, I think the best we can do, and this is a suboptimal solution in many ways and we've seen it fail in many places, but civilian oversight is a great way to at least send signals to people who are captured by a system or to elitists to know that they're harming people. Um, so to get a check every once in a while from, from regular people. Now, that means you have to have civilian oversight that's actually staffed by regular people and not just appointees, uh, privileged appointees. And those oversight boards have to have real teeth, which we've never seen that happen before and including in New York. But if we could, uh, if we could wave a magic wand, then at least that's one um, kind of signal that we could send to people to get their blinders back off. Um, this is, I mean, I'm going to put in a plug here for some of the conversations that I had with Walter Katz and, and, and Cami Chavis the other day. Walter talks about, you know, what it looks like to have civilian oversight and te with teeth, right? I'm thinking about Barry Friedman's work on, on democratic policing. Um, I, I'll also put a plug in here for the campaign of Visit a Prison. Um, I think there's a lot to be said for personal connection and empathy. Um, you know, there's, again, speaking of New Orleans, um, Judge Calvin Johnson, who you know, is near and dear to my heart, talks about the way in which he broke his own father's heart when his father came to watch him as a, as a black man sentencing in court and came back and said, you know, why'd you put that young man in jail? And, and Calvin said, well, because he would violated his probation, he failed. And his father looked at him and said, oh, no, son, he didn't fail. You did. Right. And, and I think holding that message close to all of our hearts, if we're privileged enough to be able to serve in the system rather than being victimized by it is probably the best formula. Uh, 
So we are coming really close to the end of our time together, and I wanted to ask you both if you had any closing remarks or closing thoughts, and I'm thinking here particularly about our students, because, yeah, we're kind of grim sometimes. Keep at it. Um, change can happen. Uh, I know it seems very dark at times, uh, but the criminal justice system is also one place where we've seen change come leaps and bounds and rapidly over the last decade or two. Um, not qu quick enough for people inside and their families, no doubt, but change is possible um, and it's driven by people like you. So do not uh, get disheartened. Um, and if you wanna know specifically how to plug in, please reach out. So, so I've recently been telling students who are interested in becoming prosecutors or defense lawyers or other players in the criminal justice system that um, uh, I've been encouraging them to like write down five or 10 things that they care about, that they can just um, refer to periodically. Um, so like, you know, once a year or every few months, just to make sure that they're being true to who they wanted to be before they joined a defender's office or before they joined a DA's office. So that's the advice I would give to any students who are thinking about um, becoming criminal justice actors. Because again, as we've been saying, it's very easy to become corrupted by the system. I'm gonna steal that one for myself. That's so good. Yeah, that's good <laughs> life advice. I, I agree. Well, I wanna just thank you both so much. I think I've said it to you before, but I'll say it again. I have the best job in the world because I get to do this. And I, and I get to talk to fabulous people like you and I get to think about things that matter all the time, um, sometimes enough to make your head hurt. But it's a real privilege and a real luxury to be able to do this. Um, for all of you who are still with us, I hope you will take the opportunity um, to join us for um, more of these conversations. If you've missed, um, if you missed them, you're welcome to check them out on our um, YouTube channel. Um, in the alternative, um, please consider registering for our upcoming panels. We uh, have programming coming up on prosecutors, on pretrial justice reform, and on public defense, um, all with um, amazing panelists and speakers. And again, um, I so have enjoyed having you both here. Thank you so much. And I'm really looking forward to your essays and to the 2021 SMU Law Review Symposium, um, which organized this event. And I wanna just put out a shout out to the wonderful students that did that. Um, they were committed in the first instance to making sure that this was a law review volume that spoke not only to the academy, but to practice. And I think those connections are incredibly important, and I'm incredibly proud of them for what they've put together. So thank you all so much for being with us. And it was wonderful to see you guys. Thank, thank you so much, Pam. Thanks. Take care.